Hi, I'm Dr. JC Matthews, and I'm back again to speak to you about paradigms. As I mentioned in our last lesson, I wanted to um, get a or, or take a look at how uh, the terminology and definition of the words that we find in Scripture, if we don't understand the paradigm in which they were written in, and the paradigm to whom they were written, how the uh, meaning of those words can have a diametrically uh, opposite impact upon uh, the audience that's receiving it because the message or the text was not written to that paradigm. And if we apply that paradigm to which the, um, the, the author wrote um, to a paradigm that does not occupy that same position, we can even cause the author's message to become something that he never intended. So what I'm going to do is I want to give us a couple examples. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with two different authors speaking of two, dif two different paradigms. I'm going to then look at one author in the same text who is speaking to two different paradigms. But if we don't understand his moving from one paradigm to the next, uh, even within that text, we, we would apparently have a contradiction. And then I want to take a look at a text that we read and because of the paradigm, the predominant paradigm of the church, we impose upon it a meaning that conforms with the paradigm when the, writ when the context in which that text is given uh, says something totally opposite. So I'm going to start with uh, the Apostle Paul and uh, the Apostle James. Now we know that they both have a message um, that concerns the place of works and the, and the place of faith and God's grace as it relates to um, the, their particular assigned audiences. And what we will find out is, is that if we don't understand the context in which the author first wrote those particular words and the paradigm to which they were writing, if we uh, just take them at face value and ignore the presence of an influence of a paradigm, we can come away with a conclusion that the two apostles are contradicting one another. So do this for me. Turn to Galatians um, chapter 2, verse number 16. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a look at two scriptures that Paul wrote, and then we're going to contrast those with the one scripture that James wrote. Turn to Galatians chapter 2, verse number 16. And we'll see that, um, as we mentioned in our previous lessons, that he'll be talking about the, the basis, the basics, and the assurance of our salvation, justification, or right standing with God. So Galatians chapter 2, verse number 16. He says, knowing that a man is not justified. So when you hear that word justified, you immediately know salvation paradigm because he is trying to tell them the basis of your salvation or right standing with God. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. So immediately, what, what do we have to uh, discern right away? He is speaking to an audience who is asking the question, how am I justified? And he says, not by the works of the law. So he is speaking to who? A salvation paradigm. He's not speaking to the church who's already been justified, who's already saved, or that wouldn't make any difference. I'm already saved, but how do I get saved? I'm already justified, but tell me the basis upon my justification. No, he's speaking to an audience who has that sincere and legitimate question. What is the basis of my justification with God? He says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. So again, we immediately we immediately see you are not justified by works of the law. You are, you are justified by your faith in Jesus Christ. What does that mean to you if you're already saved, if you're already righteous, if you're already justified, you're already in the kingdom paradigm? That's good to know when I take that message and go to the unsaved world, now I know how to tell them the basis of your justification, the basis of your right standing with God and the assurance of your salvation. Do you see how those paradigms really affect um, the, the meaning of meaning of a word? 
this particular text is being taught to kingdom paradigm believers who are members of churches and being told necessarily that Paul was writing to believers to tell them that there's nothing further that they need to do in the furtherance of their salvation. Well, the word furtherance of your salvation to those who are already saved means something quite different to those who are not saved because they don't have anything to further. In the kingdom paradigm, furtherance of your salvation simply means manifesting the salvation that already belongs to you, not, not gaining it or you wouldn't have anything to manifest. You receive that salvation upon your confession, you're receiving by grace and faith, the provision of work to person in the ministry of Jesus Christ by faith. You became saved, you received every spiritual blessing, you received your inheritance right then and there, it's yours. Now your job, as Paul says, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does he mean, work out your salvation? Well, he's recognizing you're already saved. Your purpose now is to manifest that salvation as a son of God. So this text being, being taught to a kingdom paradigm um, audience would compromise and would retard the ability of that, ability of that member's ability to grow in their sonship, which we're seeing today because that's a salvation paradigm being applied to a kingdom paradigm church. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 3, verse number 28. We'll see the same thing. Remember, Paul just said that you are not justified by works but by your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen, salvation paradigm. For those who are unsaved, asking that question and needing to know what is the authorized means by which I become saved or I am saved. Let's go to Romans chapter three. And we will see in Romans chapter three, let's look at verse number, let's start at verse number uh, 28. He says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law or works. So what did he say? Again, there's that word justified. So we immediately know he's talking about salvation paradigm because they are asking the question, what is the basis of my salvation? Justification and right standing with God. What is the basis of my justification, right standing and salvation with God? What is the assurance of my justification, salvation and right standing with God? So these people are in need of knowing how do I enter into a relationship with God and what is it based on? Kingdom paradigm, I'm already justified, I'm already saved. I'm already right with God. I don't need assurance of that. I don't need the conviction of that. I've matured past milk. I'm at a meat level right now. I need to know how do I manifest what I possess as a result of those things. Now, this is what James is talking about. So we see Paul emphatically speaking and emphatically saying, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law of works. Now turn with me to James chapter two, verse 24. Let me read verse number 23, because remember we talked about how the salvation paradigm has caused the church membership to become known as believers. Your job is to believe. Watch what James says as it relates to the proper perspective of kingdom paradigm with church membership. Remember I said that those throughout the New Testament are called disciples, but because salvation is so concerned about what you believe, proper belief, that salvation now being opposed on the kingdom paradigm has now caused the body of Christ to be known as believers. So it insinuates to the member that my job is to believe instead of as a disciple to demonstrate and grow in the mastery into the likeness of the master. So we see here, verse number 23, he says, and scripture was, has fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Now go up to verse number 19. Thou believest that there is one God. You do well. The devils or demons also believe and tremble. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Now let's go down to verse number 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified. He's talking about Abraham. 
Now, the thing that you have to recognize about Abraham, he was talking about Abraham's covenant with God. He said, listen, this man's already in covenant with God. So his works is not to get in covenant with God. His works is a manifestation of the fact that he is or has a covenant with God. The reason why he, James said, listen, the reason why he, he was willing and, and, and uh, did go through the process up to the place of actually plunging a knife into his, his son, the reason he was able to do that because he knew God was faithful to his covenant. So his obedience wasn't to get a covenant. His obedience, because he knew he obeyed his works, was a result of his covenant. Now, the salvation paradigm would turn that around. It says, no, you have a covenant with God. You are a son of God. You don't need to do any works. You don't need to prove anything. No, your works prove that you do have a covenant. And it's not to gain a covenant. It's because you are in covenant. Now, let's go to verse 24. He says, you see how, how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. He's talking about verse number uh, 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he is called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and uh, is justified and not by faith only. Likewise, also was Rahab. Then he goes down to verse number 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Paul, a man is not justified at all by works, but by faith alone. Galatians chapter 2 verse uh, 16. Again, you are not justified by your works. You are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Well, in both of those Paul sentences, they're asking the question, how do I become justified? James, writing to those who are in covenant with God, my brethren, speaks to the same issue of the role of justification uh, by works or faith and says that you absolutely need works. Works aren't the means by which you get faith. Your works actually demonstrate you have faith. As a matter of fact, the reason why your works are necessary to demonstrate your faith is because God's going to use your work in the natural world, which require faith to manifest his will in the earth. Remember, God's original ultimate purpose is to manifest his heavenly kingdom on earth in partnership with his sons. Because of the law of dominion in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when he gave man dominion, he committed himself to having to use the free will of a human being. And as a result of that, whenever God wants to do anything in the earth, he must find a human being to do it through. God now has the ability to do through his sons who have physical bodies. First, he did it through Jesus Christ. Christ submitted his will, not my will, but thy will be done. So God was able to do through Christ what he wanted to do if he himself was here in the earth. He sent his son in the form of a human being, filled himself in that son so that his will could be done legally in the earth through the body that his son occupied. When his son says, I'm no longer going to be here bodily, but I'm going to go to heaven. John chapter 14, verse number 12, greater works you will do than I did. Why? Because you're going to be here because I go to the father. But you will be the body, my body of Christ in the earth that God will still have a body to do his work through in the earth. Therefore, the creation groans for the manifestation of the sons of God who have physical bodies. Why? Because that is the paradigm or the way in which God has constructed his world to work. Him working through those who are authorized, who have physical bodies to do his will in the earth. When the salvation paradigm comes along and qualifies works as being against the believer and applies that salvation paradigm understanding on the believer that they are not to engage in works, now the work of the kingdom or the work of the ministry can't be done. So do you see the two? Now, I want to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8 through 10. Now watch how Paul goes back and forth dealing with the paradigms. Starting at verse number eight, he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Now, what is the issue? Salvation. He's telling these people, listen, you didn't get saved by 
your works. You were saved by God's grace. It is the gift of God, again, salvation paradigm, not of works, lest any man should boast. So he is speaking salvation paradigm. He is telling them what? The basis, the basics, and the assurance of your salvation is the grace of God, not anything that you can or will do. Now, those who have grown beyond milk, what good would this message do them? Unless you're an evangelist and you're going to go out to the unsaved world, it's perfect. But that being your diet, you've already passed this threshold. And this is what happens in a kingdom paradigm. This message being taught to kingdom paradigm people. Now watch this. Salvation paradigm. Now he's going to move to kingdom paradigm. Watch his language. For we know, for we are his workmanship. He says, now you already have been born again. You've been recreated. This is a fact right now. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He said, listen, God was waiting for the moment for you to be born again and to grow into your weas so that you could per partner with him, your sonship, your weas, grow into your partnership and your sonship so that you can be about the works that he has planned from the beginning of the world. Verses 8 and 9, he says, listen, you are not to engage in works. Let's, let's read it again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Turns around, verse number 10, speaking of parad uh, kingdom paradigm, you've been created for good works. Now, if there's anything, he says, listen, you don't enter into those works so that you don't boast. That's what he said, so that you don't boast. If you are going to be tempted to boast about anything, it would be good works. But he says that you were created for good works. How can you reconcile this? Well, if your salvation paradigm, you're asking the question, how am I justified? What's the basis of my salvation, my justification and my righteousness? Well, if you think that you did it yourself and you did it by being good, paying extra tithes, going, doing these things, and you don't understand the basis of your righteousness, your justification or your salvation, you might be tempted to boast. In the kingdom paradigm, you've been created for good works because, again, kingdom paradigm, you're talking about meat. I don't need to be assured of my salvation, be, convic be convinced of my identity or the basis or the basis of my justification, salvation, or right standing. I've already passed that. Now I'm able to engage in the work of advancing the kingdom of God and manifesting his heavenly kingdom in, on earth in partnership with him. I can engage on in those good works without boasting because I already know that by grace and faith that I've come to this place of salvation, right standing with God and being justified. So do you see this too, how he could say those two things and there be no contradiction whatsoever because we understand what? The paradigm. Now I want to close with this. I want, you to, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 19. The context is Jesus is uh, coming into an area Word gets out, Zacchaeus, who is a Jew but a tax collector, finds out that Jesus is coming and he's short of stature and he wants to see Jesus. So he jump, he, he gets in a tree, Jesus walks by, he says, uh, uh, Zacchaeus, come down, I'm going to eat at your house. So he goes to Zacchaeus' house and he starts to minister, he starts to teach. Now what do you think Jesus teaches? Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and it will tell us. Verse number 17. And from that time, this is Jesus coming right out of the, in the wilderness. He says, from that time, from that time forward, this is what Jesus taught. Began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's go down to verse number 23 to see if this is true. And Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, since we're in Luke, let's go to Luke chapter 4, verse, 30, verse uh, 43. 
And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore I am sent. This is the reason why I've been sent to teach the kingdom and presence the coming, the reality and presence of God's kingdom here on earth. So when we go to Luke chapter 19, we know what he's teaching. Verse number nine. Well, verse number eight. And Zacchaeus stood up and said unto the Lord. Now he's been listening to Jesus teach. Uh, stood up and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And, I, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusations, I restore him fourfold. So Zacchaeus heard Jesus preaching and said, do you know what? I've done a lot of people wrong. I'm going to do right. I'm going to do right for the wrong that I've done. I'm going to atone for the wrong that I've done. That's what Nicodemus just said. Now watch what Jesus says. He said, and Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Wait one minute. Because if Jesus declared him saved based on his works of trying to do right or going back to make things right, that is a blue broilerplate definition of salvation by works. Is it not? If, if Jesus declared saved, you're saved or salvation because of what you did, nowhere in here does it say that Zacchaeus said to Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior. No, Zacchaeus said, I've done wrong. I've recognized I've done wrong. I want to make atone. I want to atone for the wrong that I've done. I will pay people back for what I stole it from them. Jesus said, salvation has come to your house for he also is a son of Abraham. Now you have to understand what the son of Abraham or the Jews were anticipating. The Jews anticipated that Jesus was going to bring or the Messiah was going to bring the kingdom. That he was bringing the kingdom with him. Let's go to Acts chapter one. We'll see that this is the actual context of his closed door meeting. He had with them when he rose from the dead. Acts chapter one, verse number two. It says, and until the day in which he was taken up after that, he, he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also showed himself after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now watch verse number six. When they therefore were come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So they were waiting for it. They, they said, listen, we thought you were going to do this while you were alive. But now that you rose from the dead, have you come back to do what we anticipated that you were going to do from the beginning? This is the context in which Zacchaeus is listening to Jesus. He's saying, listen, you just taught me the kingdom. I recognize that thieves, whoremongers, adulterers, so on and so forth, don't enter the kingdom of God. Paul tells us in that in his letters. We see Jesus tell him, listen, salvation has come to your house. This word salvation in this context means kingdom. The kingdom has come to your house. Now, how do I know this? Let's keep reading. Uh, Luke chapter 19. For this, for much your son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, you got to watch this. He said, the son of man has come to seek. We know in Matthew chapter six, verse 33, he says, what are we supposed to seek first? The kingdom of God. He says, and to save not them, but that which was lost. What was lost? And what is that? He didn't say, I come to save them or they that were lost. That which was lost. When we look over scripture, we understand that Adam lost the kingdom. It's a that. We also recognize in the parables, Jesus tells of the kingdom. He says the kingdom is something that is found. The pearl of great price or the treasure that was found in the field. Both of those, he said, the people found these things and went off and sold everything they had and bought the field in one case and then sold everything that he had. So we see that the kingdom is something that is found. It's not they, but it's that. So the son of man has come to seek the king first seek first kingdom of God. That's what he told us to seek 
and to save that, not they, the kingdom of God, which was lost. The reason why we know this is the case. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God would should appear immediately. So Jesus is teaching the kingdom. He tells them that the kingdom has come. They um, he tells them this is the reason why I've come. He says, but he's telling them a story. He said, listen, it's not going to happen right now, but I'm going to come back. The reason why I know this, watch the parable that he gives them. Verse number 12, and he said, therefore, a certain nobleman, a king, went into a further country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. This is the same questions that the apostles had or the disciples had in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. He says, have you now come to restore the kingdom unto Israel? Because he had gone and then he had come back. So we recognize that the salvation paradigm has even turned this text when people have primarily read it, said, Jesus said that Zacchaeus was saved. Salvation paradigm. The reason why we know it's not a salvation paradigm is because Jesus never discussed the justification, righteousness, or the means by which they became saved. Neither did Nicodemus even speak about it. What did Jesus talk about? Jesus talked about in the parable what those citizens were supposed to be doing while he was gone before he came back. Kingdom paradigm. We really do, we really do need to have an understanding of paradigms. If we do not walk away from uh, these teachings with a determination to rectify the paradigm that the church is operating under right now, we will, consent, we will continue to see these anomalies happening in the church. Sickness, disease, depression, loss of influence, loss of rights, division, apostasy, because the work and the influence and the impact that we're supposed to be having in the world, we have doctrinally tied it up with a salvation paradigm meant for the unsaved or the immature, applied it to the body of Christ in mass, which has handcuffed it from its ability to do the work in the world that it was created to do by God. So I pray that these have been a blessing to you. I'm going to come back and do some additional teachings on paradigm. There's more that we need to understand, but I'm going to stop right here.